My name is Daro Mott, and I will be um, a presenter today for our session on root cause analysis and performance management, but I wanted to introduce you to... I'm Mary Hampton, and I'll be co-presenting with Daro on root cause analysis, and we're going to talk about how Lowell has used data and looked at root cause data specifically to take action to improve performance. And for anyone who's just joined us, we have one-page handouts which are located at the back of the conference room. So, all right, so we have a fun day for you, a fun session. We've got, um, we're going to start off with the purpose of why we're here today and what we're going to do. Then we'll talk about the power, right, of root cause data and then what we can do to get it and then we'll provide you with our contact information. So just a little bit of a background, we have a really interesting um, experience in Louisville Metro Government. We're merged city-county government, so we've got a lot of the interlapping and interlocking kinds of functions of government rolled up in one under one strong mayor. Um, we also have a full-time Office of Performance Improvement. We just became innovation, so we've just hired two innovation project managers, and we do a lot of innovation work already. And we have a reporting structure, which I think it's interesting for this group because both the Office of Performance Improvement and Innovation, as well as human resources and technology, report to one person, right? So we really try to integrate the hands and the tools to help our government become one of the best managed city governments, city county governments in the nation. Um, so our vision, as you can see, we really want everyone being a change agent who can use some of the better practices to actually do what it takes to continually improve. What's really interesting about us is we have a team now of 10, um, which it changes every, I guess, couple of months because we have so many folks who get um, poached by other departments or businesses. And um, we also have been uh, fortunate enough to kind of hire up over the few years. I remember starting with um, an office of three people and a huge workload. And we have 11 people doing much more today, or 10 or 11. So we've got a, a world-class consultant who came from McKinsey & Company who kind of <laughs> leads our efforts, the Chief of Performance Improvement and Technology, Teresa Rina Weber. She's speaking at the conference um, tomorrow, actually, on the main stage, if I'm correct, and doing a few break breakout sessions. Um, I'm the guy who's really passionate about city-county um, government. We have economist strategists, a chemical engineer. We've got lots of PMPs and PhDs. And Mary is so awesome because she was the first person who we've ever hired in city and county government who has a master's degree in? Statistics. <laughs> Which is awesome, right? <laughs> it's just so awesome. Um, so we are all achievers, learners, and uh, we you know, do what it takes every day to kind of just help our government provide better city county services. And we provide a lot of services within our office. So some of them include the performance reporting, the performance management. Uh, we do a ton of capability building, so we work with departments to make sure that they know how to use their data, visualize their data. They, we help them understand their KPIs. We kind of facilitate tons of meetings just to make sure that we're aligning our critical business processes with our data and we help them get root cause data, which is a big thing that we're, that we're talking about today. We have a very interesting office and we're pretty fortunate just to have it. Um, our mayor is a former entrepreneur turned government geek who really lives and breathes continuous improvement. Data is a really critical component to that. So one of the things that um, we emphasize in our city county context is that, you know, data should really have three different kinds of components to it, right? It should be accessible. So everyone, particularly if you're um, a citizen, you need to access data about, you know, your city services, your permits, um, your um, police report, like where, where is it? And, what stage of the process are you if you're a hiring um, candidate for us, an, an applicant who wants to work for our city county government, so yeah, data should be accessible. But it also should be auditable, right? So the data should be um, verified or be able to be verified by someone else, not just the data itself, but our process for extracting that data, right? We have a lot of assumptions when it comes to um, pulling data or extracting it, and someone else should be able to replicate our queries and, and, and how we really dissect, slice and dice the data. But what's really important from a perspective of the performance management efforts, just that operational you know, performance indicators and how well do you know that city service are doing, is that data should fundamentally be actionable, right? I mean, you should be able to do something with the data, right? Particularly if you are a top manager 
in any department, that data should tell you something, right? And so we really like the idea of that, you know, the MVP, the not the most valuable player, which I think sometimes those things are, but like, you know, that what's the minimally viable product that we can actually use, um, building, measuring, and learning along the way so that we actually produce what truly is actionable. But we have a basic and a fundamental insight, and that insight is sometimes the, what we refer to as measures, the data for the measure is not the most actionable kind of data. because It doesn't tell you what to fix, what performance deficits or opportunities for improvement do you fix. They just tell you how well services are being required. They don't tell you what to do about it. The kinds of data, there are many types of data, right, um, that can tell you what to do about it are the root cause data, the data that tells you why there's a gap between current performance and desired performance, current state and future state. Why are we off target? Do we collect data against that? So that's what this um, presentation is uh, geared around. So we're going to start today with an example of where we use root cause data and some different methods of collecting root cause data to make improvement in our performance. And then we'll talk about in more detail those methods that we use to get some of that information. So public works and assets department that we worked with, we were looking at their lost time injury rate. So how many times are they getting injured and being out of work? not productive and so their rate was hovering if you look at this chart around 15 to 20 percent during the year of 2011 and 2012 and the bureau of labor statistics says that local government should be around two percent so 15 to 20 is a lot higher than that two percent but if we just look at this can anybody tell me how to improve Just from that. Just stop working. Just stop working. Just stop working. <laughs> <laughs> no injuries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty difficult when you just look at the performance data on how to improve. So in Louisville, we have combined, and if you look at our Louis Stat website, you can see how we not only look at the performance, but we look at the root cause. And we particularly use what is called a Pareto chart. Um, and so a Pareto chart just puts your top five categories could be a little bit more a little few, uh, less but usually that top few categories of things that are causing the problem and so we looked at our data system first and what our data system gave us was the types of injuries so when we looked at the data system for the time period that you saw that 2012 time period what we got was that there were 54 strains and 13 bruises and 10 sprains. These were what were causing all of those injuries and causing that rate to be in that 15 to 20 percent versus the 2 percent that Bureau of Labor Statistics says. So now that we look at this, do you have a little bit more thoughts on what we might do to improve? And if you have thoughts, you can jot that down or those thoughts down on the paper that we handed out for this session. Yeah, we'll take a couple of minutes to answer. If you notice, that first category was strains. So just think through for a couple minutes. What might you do? What do people, why do people get strains? And then what might you do to prevent them? Common injury for city, county services, right? Yeah, why do people get strains? And so what we're doing right now, sort of a modified version of brainstorming. Usually you would do brainstorming a little bit better. Um, conference isn't really the greatest place for it, but uh, we typically like to do sticky notes and Dara will go into that a little bit further later. But thinking about brainstorming as a team, getting the right people in the room and talking about why do people get strains. So diving deeper into root cause. So we've got lifting incorrectly. Okay. Anybody else want to share a thought? Why people get stretching. strained? So not stretching? Why people might get strained? 
repetitive motion. Repetitive motion. Overworked. Yeah. Overworked. No back support. Okay. So just by looking a little bit at the data, we were able to then come up with some really better thoughts of why this is happening, which then helps us come up with our thoughts on what can we do to address these. So all of these things that we said, lifting incorrectly, lack of stretching, repetitive motions, overwork, what are some things that we could do now to address that? Education. Okay. Proper equipment. So that would be proper equipment. Modifying your rules and regulations. Okay, I'll just put this. Limit on how much they can lift by themselves. I like that. Limit on how much they lift by themselves. So already you see how much more powerful the root cause data was versus just the performance data itself. And so public works and assets have done several things and I'll show you the results and then we'll talk about some of the things that they went with. The results as you can see of the implementation of some of these brainstormed ideas was tremendous. They went from hovering around that 15 to 20% in 2012 to now they are around the 5% and been maintaining around that 5, 6% for over a year now. So they're doing really great. And so one of the things that we did uh, was out of the brainstorming, of course, we come up with the fact that they were not stretching. So Dara is going to lead us in one of the activities that got implemented every single day in their solid waste division and in their roads division, they have their supervisors and managers stretch with their employees. So Dara's going to lead us in the stretch. So everybody class. stand up. <laughs> this active conference, right? So grab your arm, right arm, turn it this way, and kind of gently pull it, not too much. You might get a strain, but just feel <laughs> the stretch, right? And you can pull it towards you and you're going to work with your, you know, your shoulder muscles, et cetera. That's a big part of what it takes to actually, you know, put trash in the um, garbage trucks, right? Let's take the other arm, let's turn it this way. Let's pull it towards us and let's stretch. All right, now relax. Okay, sit down, right? Very simple, right? Um, but just imagine what happens when you're doing repetitive motions but you're really not giving your tired or sore muscles the kind of you know, tender love and care that they need to kind of be ready for that next job. Um, and I think there are very simple solutions to common problems. The indicator, the performance indicator was the safety rate, right? 15% um, really is normalized to 15 employees out of 100 in a 12 month period get injured. <laughs> That's way too many, particularly when best in class, which is our effort, best in class operations, sometimes have zero lost time injuries for the same work or doing more work. Um, so we really wanted to do simple things that address the root causes, but the root causes help us better understand what it takes to kind of get to the improved level of performance. And just to give you some more thoughts and ideas, so of course that was just one thing that was implemented. And another thing that they have found over time is that uh, the stretching alone is not enough. So they have actually made multiple stretching uh, classes so that they can rotate after, because so long you get used to those stretching exercises. So now they rotate every, I think, three months or so and they right. do a different set of stretches and then they come back and they do a different set of stretches. And so that was something they discovered over time by continuing to pay attention to this data. They have also implemented safety audits. And so the safety audits, supervisors and managers, they go out randomly uh, on a regular basis 
every supervisor and manager goes out at least once a week and the director goes out at least once a month and then the assistant directors go out at least twice a month and they just audit the job sites to watch people to see what they're doing, what mistakes they're making and they document that in a data system that was purposely set up for um, and that's another type of thing that we can talk about on how you collect root cause data. Dara will get into it more, but just different system configurations and starting a whole new database to collect specifically information that gives us more about root cause. And so those were a couple of things that they did. Several other uh, thoughts, but if you have more questions, uh, you can ask me later. Um, we'll move on. I'll show you the Pareto analysis also changed. One thing that you'll notice about here, your injuries, lot fewer overall. Strains is still our highest, but it's only six now instead of 54. And it's a lot closer to the amount that we see in some of these other categories now. And so you only have three, two, one of these other types of injuries and only six of strains. So much better on the root cause data. And as an improvement professional, before we get into brainstorming, um, the question is, did you improve Yes, then the question is, well, how do you know that what you did made a difference? Well, your before and after Pareto chart or your bar charts really help you validate that you haven't accidentally performed better or moved the needle in the right direction. You've done something that's, you know, um, addressing the root causes of why performance was less than desirable. So that's a huge, huge way of knowing that the solutions are working. We're not at zero, but we're setting stretch targets and are trying to get there, right? So the question is, how do you get root cause data? And there is something fundamentally unsophisticated about how you can actually get root cause data, right? I think the first thing that Mary likes to do is look at what data you already are collecting. Yes, and so that was what we did with Public Works is we looked in our data system and said, we don't have real true reasons why, but we do know what those injuries are. And then we can use other methods to figure out why we have those particular injuries. So what our data system gave us for root cause data was what injuries were contributing. And your data system usually tells you something. Even if that something is in a comment box and you have to take a sample and go through just a few to start getting an idea. Another technique, which is, again, it's not sophisticated, it's not tech heavy, right, is brainstorming, right? So what in the world is brainstorming and why is it important? I think that brainstorming is so important because you can get a ton of ideas about why something is happening. What are the root causes to having a workplace that is not as safe as you want it to be, right? You can get a ton of ideas very quickly from a variety of people, right? That's a great kind of simple tool and technique to learn. And it really gets a ton of buy-in. Um, and you can do so in between 30 minutes and probably an hour, right? Simple planning, you state your problem statement, and um, you get folks just to think about why is this happening on this shift, on this route, in this area. Um, and the goal is to get as many ideas as possible so we can then figure out which ones are priority and then address them. So here's a simple process. I'm not going to go through it in its entirety. Um, I'm pretty sure you can download the slide, but um, how do you do brainstorming? There's a right way and a wrong way, right? One of the right ways is to make sure that we have the total participation, the people involved, right? So don't brainstorm from the management perspective, right? Um, get the employees in the room who are getting injured or who are working with people who get injured or who fear that they may be injured because the work is just very difficult and very repetitive, right? So get the right people in the room for the brainstorming session. You may need a facilitator, right? Um, someone who enjoys, you know, just interacting with people and extracting qualitative data from like people's minds, right? Just get a good facilitator who can lead a, a conversation and, and someone who's probably non-threatening, so maybe if we're focusing on public works and assets, we don't want an operational manager in public works and assets to lead that meeting. Call in someone from our office or an outsider who's truly neutral, who truly is you know, only married to solving real problems, not someone who wants to kind of point the blame. Get the right people in the room, get a good facilitator, put the question on the wall, right? Um, provide post-it notes, that's a very 
non-threats any way to do brainstorming, right? Um, everyone gets a post-it note and everyone writes down one idea per post-it note, right? And then suddenly you can have, you know, if you have five people, they have three posts, that's 15 ideas on their root causes. Each individual will give you probably a unique perspective. But again, you have 15 ideas, right? So what we like to do is then create um, common themes from those 15 ideas just to kind of align on if we're really going to design a data capture form that validates that for this injury, this was the root cause, we would like to have between maybe three and five fields, not 15. So we do like to consolidate the field name so that we can then use that to build tools to collect more um, root cause data. But the simple idea is to like really try it out, get a room, schedule it in advance. Um, and the, the point is to get ideas and not shoot down you know, anyone's ideas, right? So set some ground rules and, and I think that um, you can get productive content from brainstorming. So um, one of the things that I like is, you know, about brainstorming is that the crazier the ideas, the better. You can both brainstorm to determine the root cause, and then you can brainstorm to figure out what to do about the root causes that drive the most of your problem, right? Which is what we did earlier. So what? So what can we do about fundamentally why people get strains on the job, right? Um, strains you might think are commonplace, but if we get comparative data about a different team, right? A different team doing, this, doing similar work, a different shift, a different shift doing similar work, we might see differences or variation that helps us really get a sense of what is normal, right? And even again, if you, you saw from our um, line graph, our chart that showed the lost time injury rate, that what was normal was fundamentally unacceptable. We did not have a safe workplace. Um, but brainstorming helps us kind of um, discover what really is going on, particularly if you get your employees who they, they were our, our customers for the project, or um, you know, the folks who are really committed to addressing safety issues. So brainstorming, simple tool, you don't need a lot of content for it, but it unlocks powerful um, insight into what's really driving your problem. So there's another awesome, awesome tool, right? It's a little more sophisticated, but it can start out simple, right? Um, and as you know, Mary loves this tool probably more than any others, right? And there are many sampling techniques, but the basic idea is that you can get um, a valid representative sample of what's driving your performance. Because here's the deal, right? We'll, we'll talk about sampling. Um, we often have boxes of forms, like safety logs, <laughs> right? Like safety reports. And sometimes those reports are maybe 15 to like 50 pages. And it takes a lot of effort to go through every single report. Just get a valid representative sample of that report. So that's why we turn to statistical sampling, right? We simply want to get a, um, a representative sample to give us insight on what's really happening because we know that it takes time, effort, or can be disruptive to operations to get root cause data. I mean, if we're pulling um, trash collectors off their routes to get root cause data, we've got to have a really good reason for that. If we're pulling paramedics and EMTs from their shift, you know, that's costly, right? We don't want to generate overtime for pulling workers off their shifts, but we do want to, um, you know, get data that helps us answer the question about what's really happening. So here's, what I, here's a simple process for actually doing statistical sampling. Um, I would start with an expert, right? So, you know, call Mary, you will have her contact information, right? Talk to someone who does it and has done it for some time. I'm someone who's really passionate about the right way to get a representative sample. Data are of different types, right? Like some data is, is very binary. Some data gives you a lot more insight into like the length, the width, and can be broken down into smaller um, units of um, measure. So you know, talk to an expert who can help you with the sample, right? Um, and then what I would argue is you really define that 
entire population of what you want, right? Do you want to look at all people who are injured, right? That could be the population. Or do you want to look at the, or is the population all workers, right? Because you want to look at people who get injured and you want to look at people who, are, who don't get injured, right? Like really define your population because that's going to really help you determine um, the limited number of, of data points that you need for your sampling activities. Um, and then identify the right you know, instruments and tools, working with someone who does this quite a bit, who can help you figure out how many forms, right? how many data points do you, really, do you really need to get to figure out what is really happening with any degree of confidence. right? So sampling just made really simple. Here's a process. Talk to an expert. Really define your population. Um, define you know, probably the error rate that you find acceptable. You know, 5%, 10% are, are pretty common. And then let's actually start to collect the information for sampling. Um, next slide. So here is a pract practical example of how we apply statistical sampling just to figure out what's going on. So we have about 750,000 people within um, the county, okay? And we do a citizen satisfaction survey, not on a regular basis, but we do it from time to time. And can anyone guess, um, given the way we've really um, divided our population, how many people we needed, how many uh, valid survey responses we needed to get to get a valid sample of what was going on? 30? 2,500? We have 750,000. One more guess. 750? Okay. So we only needed to get the magic number is 400, okay? 400 valid survey responses, given the way that our county is actually divided, right? We took a look at not only geographic um, um, area, but like gender as well as um, income, right? And because we like to divide our, um, or stratify our population that way, we only needed 400 valid survey responses. It took about three weeks to get to really get a, some insight on citizen satisfaction with um, county and city services. So that, that was a powerful kind of technique because can you imagine trying to get 100,000 responses to a survey? Way too costly. And can you imagine the analysis that you'd have to do on um, 100,000 survey responses within a question, in a questionnaire that might have like 15 questions in it? And then just the call takers who would have, because we used our own, it's kind of innovative, our own call takers in our 311 center to actually kind of conduct this. We trained them on this. But, but can you imagine that the overtime costs and just the scheduling that it would take to get 100,000 responses? That's why sampling will save you time and money. Next example, well, this is a really interesting example. Um, we're currently looking at the process of um, how we respond to lead abatement cases, right? And we've got about 120 cases. And the question is, you know, how do we actually figure out what's going on without going through the 150 cases um, or 120 cases? Now, he here's the deal. We don't currently collect a lot of data in a structured way about those cases. We just have paper files, right? And it's daunting just to look at. And each case might be, I don't know, 50 pages in length, okay? So you can imagine it might take four hours to go through and read the case and pull out the data that you need from each case. That takes way too much time. So the question is, how many samples or how many cases we really need to actually look at, um, given the diversity within the case types? Um, and so we're going to um, look at probably around uh, 10 to 15, because given the nature of the cases that, that we're working with, we just need a representative sample of the cases to figure out what's going on with the um, 15 percent um, margin of error. So the next one that we're looking at is the hospital turnaround time and we were dealing with our EMS, our emergency services, being at the hospital, the ambulance would be there for over 30 minutes sometimes and so we were losing needed necessary people out on the streets to help those that needed to make it to the hospital because they were spending so much time at the hospital with one patient. And so we did a study and a sample 
And this is an example where even the smallest bit of sampling can really make a huge difference. So we had a couple of people who actually went out and sat at the hospitals and just documented the stuff that they observed to try to figure out what it was going on, why these ambulances were stuck at the hospital, found out some of it was purely just the ambulance was maybe forgetting to push the button to say that they had left and so it was inaccurate data and some of it was specific hospitals that were taking longer because of the process there. And so through that we were able then to work with those hospitals and improve the way that we worked and interacted with that hospital. And now we have some data sharing with those hospitals and we're able to keep a better eye on it and even collect this information in a better way. And so we've made those process improvements. And this really was a very small, it was I think two, maybe three people went out and spent two days sitting at the hospital collecting data. And then we analyzed that. So it wasn't huge, huge taxing time on um, a bunch of staff to do that. So great uh, process improvement. We went from, uh, I believe it was 12% not making it out in that 30 minute time frame that we would alight to 85%. And it was equivalent to two ambulances out on the street. So it really did save a lot of time. And Mary's example is critically important because you know, we're in the business of saving lives. We've got increased demand for service every single year. We're transporting more people to the hospital. And since the uh, adoption of the affordable uh, protection or the affordable, like, I guess the Obamacare, the, the Health Care Act, um, we're sending more and more people to the hospital with insurance now, right? So it's really interesting. But what that means is that we have an increased demand or workload for our, you know, medical transports. Um, one of the other projects that we took a look at was late runs, right? In, in this project, the employee was the customer because given the increased demands for service, we have people who work 12-hour shifts and they may get off four hours late. So, so the question is why? Um, and we, everyone has a run report or a log. The reasons why we have late runs are not captured in an easy way, right? We dispatch captures, um, the timestamps for different periods, but nothing captures why are you late but for that paper report, right? And so we spent about, um, in two different occasions, two weeks, taking a look at data from three different sources, right? Our run reports, our um, human capital management system, just to look at their um, time kind of slots, as well as another, um, the care system, just to figure out you know, why someone was late. It took a lot of effort, but we married data from three different places to really figure out why we actually had late runs, right? So the entire population would be, for that two week period, the 400 late runs that we had. And we were able to really make progress in terms of helping employees you know, see their spouses and, and families sooner, right? Because that's a huge issue um, in terms of just family dynamics is not knowing when the mother or the father will get off on the shift because they've got a run that came in about you know 15 minutes prior to their scheduled end of shift time. Yes. Can I ask a question now? Mm -hmm. or should I wait to the end? Ask now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so these are all really great examples, and, and I work for the city of San Jose, and, and we are developing um, a similar kind of uh, team to to look at these kinds of things. Um, the the issue that we're having is finding these kinds of projects to, to work on. So like, oh. how did you solicit this these projects? Did it come to you? What what kind of tips do you have for that? So we have a Louis Stat program, which is our performance management program, and we work with our departments on a regular basis, and we have them figuring out what are the measurements that you think are very important, and we start looking at those. And then from there, we look at, okay, where are the ones that need improvement? And that's where these project ideas mostly come from, is those measurements the departments that are very important, meaningful to them, and they need improvement, and so that, most of these came from that. Our citizen survey was about how our citizens felt about safety and our lead abatement. Again, it was um, economic development, I believe. What, what department was Develop it? Louisville. Develop yeah. Louisville, thank you. Develop Louisville, it was one of their measurements that they were really looking at. And then these other two were our EMS department measurements that they said were very important. 
And to piggyback on what Mary said, um, two things. One, you know, we have conversations with the leaders within the business, and we ask them, what keeps you up at night, right? What's going on? Because we speak a kind of technical language, and, but we really want to know what keeps them up at night. And we try to figure out, well, what can we do to kind of co-create a structured experience to kind of deal with the problem? Just asking people, talking to them, I think can get um, results. I would invite you to tomorrow's session on the enterprise model because that's a very robust methodology that we use for problem discovery, right? So we really look at what the department does as a business, its fundamental purpose, its mission, right? Uh, we we kind of um, spin that into a value proposition. And then we look at the critical business processes that it takes to deliver upon that value proposition. And then it's who's responsible for it and who contributes to it. What are the required outputs or city county services? What's the existing capability to deliver those services? What, what would a world-class capability look like, right? And then what are the measures of performance that we can use that measure the gap? Like the gap between today's capability and tomorrow's capability. And then what are the gap, I guess it's, it's like a gap rating or prioritization, high, medium, low. Um, how big is the gap and how do we measure that against different ways? But we facilitate that experience with the line managers who run the operations and they discover and tell you what their problems are. And then you have a conversation around, well, what problem do we want to fix? And we can apply different tools and techniques to kind of help them address it, but that's probably the most robust way. Good question. Great question. <laughs> So, so our last yeah. uh, method for collecting our root cause data is through new data collection or reconfiguring your data systems for that new data collection. And I spoke a little bit about um, an example, and so I'll get a little bit more into it. But why we use this is we want, we want data about root cause. We don't just want to know how well we're performing. We want to know why we're not performing at the levels that we'd like to be. And so that's really the main reason that we're going to collect new data because that is the movement that we're going to. We are in a world of data. People want to know more and more information every day. So we need ways of collecting new information that is part of the data that can help them make decisions and move forward on their performance. Um, so the example that I talked about, and this is giving you a process of how you can do this, data collection plan, but the example I talked about earlier was public works in their lost time injury rate. They started a whole new data collection where they are doing s sampling, of course. They go out and do audits, sample audits, all the time on a regular basis and then gives them more information of what people are actually doing and they can prevent the injuries from happening in the first place. And so that's one example. Another good example of just a completely reconfiguring in a simple way a data system with our corrections department. They were collecting data on their releases whenever they release people from the, their system. And they were collecting in a spreadsheet which is fine, you know, so some of them, that's where they're at. So they collect their data in an Excel spreadsheet, but they were really struggling with analyzing that data and seeing how well they were doing because that spreadsheet was five people filling it out. They all filled it out different ways. And so just working with that system to put some controls on it, making sure that in their date field, people could only enter dates. In their time field, people could only enter times. Um, that their menu of choices of why they were being released or why they were late from being released, there was a short list of things that they could fill out and not just everybody types in what they want. And so you end up with three different ways that the same reason was typed because there was no control on that. So just simple things like that. Um, Having a collection plan, really, really important. So really working with your people to discuss before you start making these changes, what information do you really need to have? And how do you need to have that information? Because a lot of our information for root cause data is in this comment box that's three paragraphs long and you have to take all that out 
And so right now you sample a lot of that, but let's see those pieces that were really important from that comment box in that sample. And can we turn those into three separate fields that now we can collect in that data system? Um, so those are really, really important to really discuss that and think that through what is it that you need. I, I won't read all this to you. I'll let you guys uh, figure that out. So here's just an example of a data collection plan. Some of the questions you should ask. Who collects the information? What is it that I'm collecting? Where can I find it? Where do I, when do I want to have this new information? How do I want it? What's some check things? That check step is really important to make sure that the data is still what you need and any changes you need to make, you can make. And so I really talked about this system reconfiguration, I think, at the same time. But thinking that through reconfiguring your systems, anything to add, Dara? This is where root cause data marries itself to the technology, right? Now we have motivated managers who want to use data, but they don't have a form that feeds a database or an application which they can use to quickly query something that's searchable, right, the database. And that's where we can design solutions that people actually use for everyday business operations, using whatever toolkits we have um, or expand or buying something, right, or just actually making something for the first time. Because the form needs to be, allow you to create structured data, right? Um, and that data should be, you know, queryable, searchable. We're migrating to Office 365, um, but we still have like MDTs within different um, units, like ambulances and fire trucks, et cetera, that um, have data feeds and data is in different places. And, and how do you get data to talk to um, the people, right? And how do you make that data accessible to the managers who need it? Because the way that it's recorded is not something which is friendly for a non-technical manager to use, but this is where we can develop applications, and we're doing that in the um, parks department right now. You think that collecting attendance is, data is simple, <laughs> but do you count someone if they are there for five minutes, 10 minutes, what if they check out? Um, can we design like a, like Kroger does it or any supermarket, you've got that you know, rewards member card which collects data and it's interesting, right? And you can do a lot of analytics off that, but we're designing that, you know, for um, counting attendance, right? A, a form that is web-based where any manager can then use to key in um, information about demographics in one location that feeds a SQL database and then we can write scripts off that database and then you can put that on your open data portal and it's trustworthy data, but that's where we can actually kind of blend some of the root cause data with the performance management activities and then get technologists to help us design the tools that can help answer key business questions. We've, um, but before we take additional questions, we have a, a we work with a variety of vendors which support um, the various lines of business, right? We've got the police department, which has probably five massive information systems and they have fixed fields. Well, when you change the field, right, the, the tables, that's going to change and, and impact any report that's derived from those tables, right? So that costs money. We want low cost solutions to do that. And that's why it's real, very important to have just that open data. That's why this data plan is so important. <laughs> Um, and for many of our projects, we've had to really restructure how we collect the data because the data may no longer answer today's business problems, right? So we need to kind of modify the fields and, and create new forms. So we have a few questions on our worksheet just for you guys to think about. A um, few ways that brainstorming could be applied in your work. If you just take a moment to think about that and anybody want to share some ideas, um, so that other folks can go away with thoughts on where they might use brainstorming. Let's take a minute or two. Anybody want to share an example of where they might use brainstorming?
who really wants to brainstorm. And you can brainstorm in your personal life as well. Yeah. So my wife asks me, why are you um, picking up our son from the after school care program um, 15 minutes before it closes? I, I say, let's sit down and just brainstorm about that, right? <laughs> It kind of makes the conversation less emotional. <laughs> He's not over-exaggerating. He truly really takes all this stuff home with him. <laughs> if you flip over to the back and ask you to think about a few more things, maybe think about if no one wants to give an example of where you might brainstorm, maybe some examples of where you could apply sampling or even some data reconfiguration. It's not a, it's not a the data reconfiguration thing. Are there certain um, are there certain in, like certain things you look at that kind of key you in to know that this is actually a root cause or a good potential root cause data set? So like if you're looking at new data or if you're wanting to uh, change or reconfigure how something's collected. Um, what kind of keys you in to say, okay, that should be, maybe this is what I'm looking at versus that, other, other than just knowing the business process and the business, like if you're agnostic to that, are there certain aspects of the data that you, that you kind of look at to say, oh, that probably is root cause because I have to X, Y, and Z or something? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start that and, and hand it off to Mary. So the, the question, um, you know, has to do with how do you know if you really have a good criterion for root cause data versus something that you think is root cause data, right? And so one of the ways to do that is to um, organize a list of simple root causes and go and observe the process and validate that, okay, that this does happen. Another way is to um, have a really good definition of something that is undesirable, problematic, or a, a defect and then make sure that you're creating or collecting data that in theory answers why that defect occurs. So one example is, um, let's talk about fire response times. A defect might be you are not responding per the benchmark or per what the National Fire Protection Association says is the standard, right? So then you will know that there are some responses that I don't respond on time then brainstorm you know, with the team on why that might happen, and then observe the process. And that should help you verify that you really have um, root cause data. We kind of document those in check sheets. Mary? I want to answer this a little differently because I kind of took your question a little differently. Um, so when I look at data that I might not be totally familiar with, uh, Dara, Dara's on a different perspective. I actually pull data and look at it a lot. And so if I pull data, I first look for information that I can easily see different groups and categories um, and ways of separating it. And I tend to actually look for those comment boxes when I'm looking at data and see if in those comment boxes I see common themes popping out at me. Um, and so that's what I do to really look for root cause data that's already in the system. And then I ask myself, does this make sense? And I might then have to go to the subject matter expert and the person who's on this process to figure out, does this make sense? Are these reasons why you might be struggling in this area? Or is this just something that I saw that maybe doesn't make sense? So I would then go to the subject matter expert, but that's what I tend to look for. Categories and groups of data that really just pop out um, and really in those comment areas are usually the most common place that I find them. And is it usually the disaggregate data, right? It's if they kind of you're getting down to the most detailed that you can see it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a, uh, an analogy that I'm seeing with kind of, you know, product storage, which uh, the sort of work that I do, where um, if we're trying to, trying to understand user behavior, we'll ask why until 
why yeah. we love that method. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, so this, I mean, disaggregating was, was helpful because until you do that, you can't do the next thing. But right. muscle strain wasn't, wasn't the, the root, root cause. Muscle strain is why is the number so high, or why is muscle strain so high. And then you go, at some point, you're like, okay, well, answering the question of why garbage weigh a lot might not. The other thing was sort of probably a Absolutely. And sometimes we kind of think of them as tiers of root causes. So mm -hmm. why are you injured? Well, I've got a strain. That's tier one. Well, why do you have a strain? Well, it might be because I did not, you know, exercise or um, I work two shifts, right? Or I was working too quickly. That might be tier two. Here's our contact information, um, so you can jot that down if you want to. You can um, see us. We have our business cards as well, so you can get that information from us. Are there any other questions? Anybody want to share ideas that they jotted down or thought about? That's a beautiful question, right? Like what happens next in the process of problem solving? So there are many ways to answer that question. Here's one. Now that you understand what is happening, okay, you then can create some sort of list of why that happens, right? Then um, once you believe you know why, because you've sat down in a room with people and you've figured out why, then you can go and observe the process and validate and collect data Right, again, that confirms that what, why you believe the uh, problems occur are indeed the real reasons. Okay, if you've confirmed the root causes and quantified them with data, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, then you can create an action plan that says, here's what we think we can do quickly with a big impact to address the root causes. Then we run those trials or experiments, and then we go back and validate the impact of those experiments against the original problem. So we re-pull the data, we monitor and diagnose and pull the data again and again and again, just to make sure that we're one, improving our injury rate, and two, as you saw in this example, we're dealing with the quantifiable strains that are driving the most of the problem. And so it really lends itself to experimentation because you might, may not know why this shift or this route actually is more prone to injury but you should always collect data confirming what your perceived you know, reasons, and then you want to test to see if what you've done from an action step perspective has made a difference on your lost time injury rate. And I would argue that you need to see that you've made a difference that is sustainable, so look at your performance over in a time series. Is that, is that helpful? Yes, and I think a funny story is that we looked at what causes injuries in the fire department. In the fire department, the firefighters say, Daro, don't you know what we do? I think so. We run into burning buildings. That's why we get injured. And I said, well, let's look at the data. And then you look at the data, you parse it out from a root cause perspective. Half the injuries occur outside of the fire grounds, right? And then the question, well, why does that happen? Strains, they're cooking, they're working out in the gym. Right? I mean, they're just doing things that you know, cause injury. And then we say, OK, how does the safety committee work? Is it effective? Right? When did it meet? What did it do? Like, who was kind of, what case was reviewed? Is that being effective, yes or no? How do we know that? Let's look at the root cause data. And also, well, does this training work? We're training all of our paramedics and um, technicians on different techniques for lifting. And we are going to see. Is that truly making a difference in terms of our overall injury rate? So it's constant. We have a laboratory 
within government to see what works and what doesn't work. And I'll add to that. Um, so the example I gave earlier about public works, one of the solutions that we had done was implementing stretching. And we kept watching the data. And what they found was that at first stretching worked really great and then it wasn't as effective after a little bit of time and so then they come back and thought through and said okay let's add multiple routines so that they could rotate their stretching and found that that actually improved even more than just the one type of stretching and so we have done that um, the way to get resources pulled towards those types of things is to basically show that, hey, this stuff works. Uh, and so we actually have more resources now in public works that work on the safety. Another thing that we had implemented was some training. And we got more people dedicated to training on safety and on equipment due to showing that, hey, look, these people went to classes and trained and now are having fewer injuries. And so we were able to then argue our point to get more resources pulled that way. And so that is a way to do that. Other questions? Well, thank you so much for your time. <laughs>